from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Fearful Rock by Manly Wade Wellman, Part 3 The story thus far, seeing the Missouri-Arkansas border in Civil War times, within the shadow of a natural obelisk called Fearful Rock, a deserted haunted house. Annet Mandifer is sent there by her stepfather, Purcell Mandifer, as a sacrifice to the nameless one he worships. She encounters instead Lieutenant Kane Lenart of the Union Army, who has camped his cavalry patrol at the demon haunted house. Her story of strange worship puzzles and repels Lenark and his semi-fanatical sergeant Jaeger, yet the lieutenant is attracted by her. A horned image found in the cellar is smashed by Jaeger, and in its hollow middle is discovered a strange, unopenable box. Lenark hides this in a brick oven of the house, just as Mandifer and his son appear and predict dire things to come. Southern guerrillas attack and flee again when the house burst into blue flame. Six of the guerrillas have been killed, also the two Mandifer men, but when a grave is prepared, the two latter bodies have disappeared. After the war, Lenark returns to the fearful rock country. He finds Sergeant Jaeger working as a frontier preacher and Annet Mandifer living alone and haunted in her stepfather's house. Later, visiting the rock at night, he learns that the gorilla's grave is opened. Besides it, he meets and fights an enemy who proves to be one of the enemy he himself killed. He discusses the mysterious horror with Jaeger, and they determine to fight it. Ended Mandifer, interviewed, remembers something of Purcell Mandifer's strange worship and of a box which he claimed held his fate and fortune. It could be opened only at midnight under a full moon such as will shine that very night. The story continues. 11. Return of the Sacrifice Through the cross-hatching of new-leaf branches, the full moon shone down from its zenith. The Nark and Enid Mandifer walked gingerly through the night-filled timber in the gully beyond, which they knew lay the ruins of the house where so much repellent mystery had been born. It's just eleven o'clock, whispered Lenark, looking at his big silver watch. He was dressed in white shirt and dark trousers, with an outcoat, hat, or gloves. His revolver rode in the front of his waistband, and as he limped along, the sheath of Jaeger's old cavalry saber thumped and rasped his left boot top. We must be almost there. We are there, replied Enid. Here's the clearing and a little brook of water. She was right. They had come to the open space where first they had met. The moonlight made the ground and its new grass pallid and struck frosty gold lights from the runlet in the very center of the clearing. Beyond to the west lay menacing shadows. Anne had stooped and laid upon the ground the hand mirror she carried. Stand to one side, she said, and please don't look. Lanark obeyed and the girl began to undress. The young man felt dew at his mustache and a chill in his heart that was not from dew. He stared into the trees beyond the clearing, trying to have faith in Jaeger's plan. We must make the devils come forth and face us, the sergeant preacher had argued. Miss Mandifer shall be our decoy to draw them out where we can get at them. All is very strange, but this much we know. The unholy worship did go on. Miss Mandifer was to be sacrificed as part of it, and when the sacrifice was not completed, all these evil things happened. We have the hauntings, the blue fire of the house, the creature that attacked Mr. Lanark, and a host of other mysteries to credit to these causes. Let us profit by what little we have found out. 
and put an end to the devil's rule in this country. It had all sounded logical, but Lanark listening had been hesitant until Annette herself agreed. Then it was that Jaeger, strengthening his self-assumed position of leadership, had made the assignments. Annette would make the journey as before from her house to the gully, there strip and say the words with which her stepfather had charged her four springs ago. Lanark, armed, would accompany her as guard. Jaeger himself would circle far to the east and approach the ruins from the opposite direction, observing and, if need be, attacking. These preparations Lanark reviewed mentally, while he heard Enid's bare feet splashing timidly in the water. It came to him, a bit too late, that the arms he bore might not avail against supernatural enemies. Yet Jaeger had seemed confident. Enid was speaking, apparently repeating the ritual that was supposed to summon the unnamed god-demon of Purcell Landifer. A maid alone and pure I stand, not upon water nor on land. I hold a mirror in my hand in which to see what fate may send. She broke off and screamed. Lenark whipped around. The girl stood, misty pale in the wash of moonlight, all crouched and curved together like a bow. It was coming, she quavered. I sighed in the mirror. Over yonder, among those trees. Lenark glared across a little strip of water and the moonlit grass beyond. Ten paces away between two trunks, something shone in the shadows, shone darkly like tar, though the filtered moon rays did not touch it. He saw nothing of the shape save that it moved and lived and watched. He drew his revolver and fired. Twice there was a crash of twigs as though something had flinched backwards at the reports. Lenark splashed through the water and, despite his limp, charged at the place where the presence lurked. 12. Jaeger It had been some minutes before eleven o'clock when Jaeger reined in his old black horse at a distance of two miles from Fearful Rock. Most of those now alive who knew Jaeger personally are apt to describe him as he was when they were young and he was old. A burly gray beard, a notable preacher and exhorter, particularly at funerals, he preferred the New Testament to the Old, though he was apt to misquote his text from either, and he loved children, and once preached a telling sermon against the proposition of infant damnation. His tombstone at Fort Smith, Arkansas, bears as epitaph a verse from the third chapter of the first book of Samuel. Here am I, for thou didst call me. Jaeger, when young, is harder to study and to visualize. However, the diary of a long-dead farmer's wife of Pennsylvania records that the Jaeger boy was dull but serious at school and that his appetite for mince pie amounted to a passion. In Topeka, Kansas, lives a retired railroad conductor whose father on the pre-rebellion frontier once heard Jaeger defy southern hoodlums to shoot him voting three state in a territorial election. Ex-Major Kane Lenart mentioned Jaeger frequently and with admiration in the remarkable pen and ink memoir on which the present narrative is based. How he approached Fearful Rock and what he encountered there, he himself often described verbally to such of his friends as pretended that they believed him. The moonlight showed him a stunted tree with one gnarled root looping up out of the earth, and to that root he tethered his animal. Then, like Lenark, he threw off his coat, strapping it to the cantle of his saddle, and unfastened his hickory blue shirt at the throat. From a saddle bag he drew a trusty-looking revolver, its barrel sawed off. Turning its butt toward the moon, he spun the cylinder to make sure that it was loaded. Then he thrust it into his belt without benefit of holster, and started on foot toward the rock and its remained of a house. Approaching, he sought by instinct the cover of trees and bush clumps, moving smoothly and noiselessly. Jaeger had been noted during his service in the Army of the Frontier for his ability to scout at night, an ability which he credited to the fact that he had been born in the darkest hours. He made almost as good progress as though he had been moving in broad daylight. At eleven o'clock sharp, as he guessed, like many men who never carry watches, he had become good at judging the time. He was within two hundred yards of the rock itself, and cover had run out. There he paused, chin deep, in a clump, of early weeds. Lenark and the girl, as he surmised, must be well into the gully by this time. 
he, Jaeger small as he remembered, with what a clarity the narc had accepted the assignment of bodyguard to Annette Nandifer. Those two young people acted as if they were now on the brink of falling in love, and no mistake. His eyes were making out details of the scene ahead. Was even the full moon so bright as all this? He could not see very clearly the ruined foundations, for they sat in a depression of the earth. Yet there seemed to be a clinging blue light at about the point, a feeble but undeniable blue. Mentally he compared it to deep still water, then to the poorest of skim milk. Jaeger remembered the flames that once had burned there, blue as amethyst. But the blue light was not solid, and it had no heat. Within it, dimmed as though by mist stood and moved, figures. They were human, at least they were upright, and they stood in a row like soldiers all but two. That pair was dark-seeming, and one was grossly thick, the other thin as an exclamation point. The line moved, bent, formed a weaving circle which spread as its units opened their order. Jaeger had never seen such a maneuver in four years of army service. Now the circle was moving, rolling around, the figures were tramping counterclockwise, wearishins was the old-fashioned word for that kind of motion, as Jaeger remembered from his boyhood in Pennsylvania. The two darker figures, the ones that had stood separate, were nowhere to be seen. Perhaps they were enclosed in the center of the turning circle, the moving shapes of which numbered six. There had been six of Quantrill's gorillas that died in almost that spot. The ground was bare except for spring grass, but Jaeger made shift to crawl forward on hands and knees, his eyes fixed on the group ahead, his beard bristling nervously upon his set chin. He crept ten yards, twenty yards, forty. Some high stalks of grass, killed but not leveled by winter, afforded him a bit of cover, and he paused again, taking care not to rustle the dry stems. He could see the maneuvering creatures more plainly. They were men all right, standing each upon two legs, waving each two arms. No, one of them had only one arm and a stump. Had not one of Quantrill's men? Yes. It came to the back of Jaeger's mind that Lenark himself had cut away an enemy's pistol hand with a stroke of the saber. Again he reflected that there had been six dead gorillas, and that six were the forms treading so strange a measure yonder. He began to crawl forward again, sweat, made a slow, cold trickle along his spine. But the two that had stood separate from the six were not to be seen anywhere inside the circle or out, and Jaeger began to fancy that his first far glimpse had shown him something strange about that pair of dark forms, something inhuman or subhuman. Then a shot rang out, clear and sharp. It came from beyond the circle of creatures and the blue misted ruins. A second shot followed it. Jaeger almost rose into plain view in the moonlight, but fell flat a moment later. Indeed, he might well have been seen by those he spied upon, had they not all turned in the direction whence the shots had sounded. Jaeger heard voices, a murmur of them, with nothing that sounded like articulate words. He made bold to rise on his hands for a closer look. The six figures were moving eastward as though to investigate. Jaeger lifted himself to hands and knees, then rose to a crouch. He ran forward, drawing his gun as he did so. The great, uneven shaft that was fearful rock gave him a bar of shadow into which he plunged gratefully, and a moment later he was at the edge of the ruin-filled foundation hole, perhaps at the same point where Lenark had stood the night before. From that pit rose the diluted blue radiance that seemed to involve this quarter. Staring thus closely, Jaeger found the light similar to that given off by rotten wood or fungi or certain brands of lucifer matches. It was like an echo of light. He pondered rather absently and almost grinned at his own malpropism, but he was not here to make jokes with himself. He listened, peered about, then began moving cautiously along the lip of the foundation hole. Another shot he heard and a loud, defiant yell that sounded like Lenark, then an answering burst of laughter, throwy and muffled, that seemed to come from several mouths at once. Jaeger felt a new and fiercer chill. He, an earnest Protestant from birth, signed himself with the cross, signed himself with the right hand that clutched his revolver. Yet, 
there was no doubt as to which way lay his duty. He skirted the open foundation of the ruined house, moved eastward over the trampled earth where the six things had formed their open order circle. Like Lenark, he saw the open grave trench. He paused and gazed down. Two sack-like blotches of pallor lay there. Lenark had described them correctly. They were empty human skins. Jaeger paused. There was no sound from ahead. He peered and saw the ravine to eastward filled with trees and gloom. He hesitated at plunging in. The place was so ideal an ambush. Even as he paused, his toes at the brink of the open grave, he heard a smashing, rustling noise. Bodies were returning through the twigs and leafage of the ravine, returning swiftly. Had they met Lanark and vanquished him? Had they spied or sensed Jaeger in their rear? He was beside the grave, and since the first year of the war he had known what to do. With enemy approaching and a deep hole at hand, he dived in, head first like a chipmunk into its burrow, and landed on the bottom on all fours. His first act was to shake his revolver, lest sand had stopped the muzzle. A charm from the long-lost friend book whispered itself through his brain, a marksman charm to bring accuracy with a gun. He repeated it, half audibly without knowing what the words might mean. Ut nemo incens tenant, descender nemo, a presidente spector mantica tergo. At that instant, his eyes fell upon the nearest of the two pallid, empty skins, which lay full in the moonlight. He forgot everything else, for he knew that collapsed face, even without the sharp stiletto-like bone of the nose to jut forth in its center. He knew that narrowness through the jowls and temples, the height of brow, that hair white as thistledown, Purcell Mandifer's skull, had been inside. It must have been there and living recently. Jaeger's left hand crept out and drew quickly back as though it had touched a snake. The texture of the skin was soft, clammy, moist, fresh, and the other pallidity like a great empty bladder that could have fitted no other body than the gross one of LaRue Mandifer. Thus Jaeger realized had the narc entered the grave on the night before and found these two same skins. Looking up, Lenark had found a horrid enemy waiting to grapple him. Jaeger, too, looked up. A towering silhouette shut out half the starry sky overhead. 13. Lenark The combination of pluck and common sense is something of a rarity, and men who possess that combination are apt to go far. Cain Lenark was such a man, and though he charged unhesitatingly across a little strip of water and at the unknown thing in the trees, he was not outrunning his discretion. He had seen men die in his time, many of them in abject flight, with bullets overtaking them in the spine or the back of the head. It was nothing pleasant to watch, but it crystallized within his mind the realization that dread of death is no armor against danger, and that an enemy attacked is far less formidable than an enemy attacking. That brace of maxims comforted him and bore him up in more tight places than one. And General Blunt of the Army of the Frontier, an officer who was all that his name implies and who was never given to overstatement, once so unbent as to say in official writing that Captain K. Lenark was an ornament to any combat force. And so his rush was nothing frantic. All that faltered was his lame leg. He meant to destroy the thing that had showed itself but fully as definitely he meant not to be destroyed by it. As he ran, he flung his revolver across to his left hand and dragged free the saber that danced at his side. But the creature he wanted to meet did not bite his coming. He heard another crash and rattle. It had backed into some shrubs or bushes further in among the trees. He paused under the branches of the first belt of timber, well aware that he was probably a fair mark for a bullet. Yet he did not expect the gun in the hands of whatever lurked ahead. He was not sure at all that it even had hands. Of a sudden he felt, rather than saw motion upon his left flank, he pivoted upon the heel of his sound right foot and lifting the saber spat professionally between hilt and palm. He meant killing the Lenark, but nothing presented itself. A chuckle drifted to him, a contemptuous burble of sound, 
He thought of what Enid had said about divining her stepfather's mockery. Again the chuckle, dying away toward the left. But up ahead came more noise of motion, and this was identifiable as feet. Heavy, measured tramping of feet. New and stupid recruits walk like that in their first drills. So did tired soldiers on the march, and the feet were coming his way. The narc's first reaction to this realization was of relief. Marching men, even enemies, would be welcome because he knew how to deal with them. Then he thought of Enid behind him, probably a retreat out of the gully. He must give her time to get away. He moved westward toward the approaching party, but with caution and silence. The moonlight came patchily down through the lattice-like mass of branches and twigs, and again Lenark saw motion. This time it was directly ahead. He counted five, then six figures, quite human. The moonlight, when they moved in it, gave him glimpses of butternut shirts, white faces. One had a great waterfall of beard. Lenark drew a deep breath. Stand, he shouted, and with his left hand leveled his pistol. They stood, but only for a moment. Each figure's attitude shifted over so slightly as Lenark moved a pace forward. The trees were sparse around him, and the moon shone stronger through their branches. He recognized the man with the great beard. He did not need to see that one arm was hewed away halfway between wrist and elbow. Another face was equally familiar with its sharp mustaches and wide eyes. He had stared into it no longer ago than last night. The six gorillas stirred into motion again, approaching and closing in. Lenark had them before him in a semicircle. Stand, he said again, and when they did not, he fired, full for the center of that black beard in his forefront. The body of the gorilla started and staggered no more. It had been hit, but it was not going to fall. Lenard knew a sudden damp closeness about him, as though he stood in a small room full of sweaty garments. The six figures were converging like beasts seeking a common trough or manger. He did not shoot again. The man he shot was not bleeding. Six pairs of eyes fixed themselves upon him with a steadiness that was more than unwinking. He wondered inconsequentially if those eyes had lids. Now they were within reach. He fell quickly on guard with his saber, whirling it to left, then to right. The old molinets he had learned in the fencing room at the Virginia Military Institute. Again, the half dozen approachers came to an abrupt stop, one or two flinching back from the twinkling tongue of steel. Lenark extended his arm, made a wider horizontal sweep with his point, and the space before him widened. The two forms at the horns of the semicircle began to slip forward and outward, as though to pass him and take him in the rear. That won't do, Lenark said aloud, and hopped quickly forward, then lunged at the black beard. His point met flesh, or at least a soft substance. No bones impeded it. A moment later, his basket hilt thudded against the butternut shirt front. The figure reeled backward from the force of the blow. With a practiced wrench, Lenard cleared his weapon, cutting fiercely at another who was moving upon him with an unnerving lightness. His edge came home, and he drew it vigorously toward himself. A bread-slicing maneuver that was surely a flesh open to the bone. The sable one assailant. But the creature only tottered and came in again, and Lenark saw that the face he had hacked almost in two was the one with bulge eyes and spiked mustaches. All he could do was sidestep and then retreat, retreat eastward in the direction of fearful rock. The black-bearded thing was down, stumbled or swooning, and he sprang across it. As he did so, the body writhed just beneath him, clutching with one hand upward. Hooked by an ankle, Lenark fell sprawling at full length, losing his revolver, but not his sword. He twisted over at his left side, hacking murderously in the direction of his feet. As once before, he cut away a hand and wrist and was free. He surged to his feet and found the black beard also up, thrusting its hairy, fishy white face at him. With dark rage swelling his every muscle, Lenark carried his right arm back across his chest, his right hand with a hilt going over his left shoulder. Then he struck at the hairy head with all the power of arm and shoulder and turning his body, thrust in its weight behind the blow. The head 
flew from the shoulders as though it had been stuck there ever so lightly. Then the others were pushing around and upon him. The narc smelled blood, rot, dampness, filth. He heard for the first time soft, snickering voices that spoke no words but seemed to be sneering at him for the entertainment of one another. The work was too close to thrust. He hacked and hewed and struck with a curved guard as with brass knuckles, and they fell back from him, all but one form that could not see. It tottered heavily and gropingly toward him, hunching its headless shoulders and holding out its handless arms, as though it played with him a game of blind man's buff. And from that horrid, a truncated enemy, Lenark fled, fled like a deer for all his lameness. They followed, but they made slow, stupid work of it. Lenark's sword, which could not kill, had wounded them all. He was well ahead, coming to rising around, toiling upward out of the gully into the open country shadowed by fearful rock. He paused there, clear of the trees, wiped his clammy brow with the sleeves of his left arm. The moon was so bright overhead that it almost blinded him. He became aware of a kneading, clasping sensation at his right ankle, at his right ankle, and looked down to see what caused it. A hand clung there, a hand without arm or body. It was a pale hand that moved and crawled as if trying to mount his bootleg and get at his belly, his heart, his throat. The bright moon showed him the strained tendons of it and the scant coarse hair upon its wide back. Lenark opened his lips to scream like any woman, but no sound came. With his other foot he scraped the thing loose and away. Its fingers quitted their hold grudgingly, and under the sole of his boot they curled and writhed upward, like the legs of an overturned crab. They fastened upon his instep. When, with the point of his saber, he forced the thing free again, still he saw that it lived and groped for a hold upon him. With his lip clenched bloodily between his teeth, he chopped and minced at the horrid little thing, and even then its severed fingers humped and inched upon the ground like worms. It won't die, Lenard murmured hoarsely, aloud. Often in the past he had thought that speaking thus, when one was alone, presaged the insanity. It won't die. Not though I chop it into atoms until the evil is driven away. Then he wondered for the first time, since he had left Anid where Yeager was. He turned in the direction of the rock and the ruined house and walked wearily for perhaps twenty paces. He was swimming in sweat and blood throbbed in his ears. Then he found himself looking into the open grave where the gorillas had lain. Once they had issued to fight once more. At the bottom he saw the two palenesses that were empty skins. He saw something else, a dark form that was trying to scramble out. Once again, he tightened his grip upon the hilt of his saber. At the same instant, he knew that still another creature was hurrying out of the gully and at him from behind. 14. Anid The narc's guess was wrong. Anid Mandifer had not retreated westward up the gully. She had stared all in a heart-stopping chill as the narc made for the thing that terrified her. As though of themselves her hands reached down to the earth, found her dress, and pulled it over her head. She thrust her feet into her shoes, then she moved at only a fast walk back to Lenark. There was really nothing else she could have done, and Lenark might have known that, had he been able to take thought in the moments that followed, had she fled, she would have had no place to go safe to the house where once her stepfather had lived, and it would be no refuge but a place of whispering horror. Two, she would be alone, dreadfully alone. It took no meditation on her part to settle the fact that Lenark was her one hope of protection. As a matter of simple fact, he would have done well to remain with her, on the defensive, but then he could not have foreseen what was waiting in the shadowed woods beyond. She did carry something that might serve as a weapon, the hand mirror, and in a pocket of her dress lay the Bible, of which had once told Lenark. She had read much in it, driven by terror, and I dare say it was as much a talisman to her as was the long-lost friend to Jaeger. Her lips pattered a verse from it, Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God, for lo, they lie in wait for my soul. It was hard for her to decide what she had expected to find within the rim of trees beyond the clearing. Lenark was not in sight, but a commotion had risen some little distance ahead, and it moved onward because she must. 
She heard Lenart's pistol shot and then was sounded like several men struggling. She tried to peer and see, but there was only a swirl of violent motion, and through it the flash of steel. That would be Lenart's saber. She crouched behind a wide trunk. That is useless, said an accented voice she knew, close at her elbow. She spun around, stared, and sprang away. It was not her stepfather that stood there. The form was human to some degree. It had arms and legs and a featureless head, but its nakedness was slimy, wet, and dark, and about it clung a smell of blood. That is useless, muttered once more the voice of Purcell Mandifer. You do not hide from the power that rules this place. Behind the first dark slimness gave a second shape, a gross immensity, equally black and foul and shiny. LaRue? You have offered yourself, said Purcell Mandifer, though Enid could see no lips moving in the filthy seeming shadow that should have been a face. I think you will be accepted this time. Of course, it cannot profit me. What I am now, I shall be always. Perhaps you too. LaRue's voice chuckled and Enid ran, toward where Lenark had been fighting. That would be more endurable than this mad dream forced upon her. Anything would be more endurable. Twigs and thorns plucked at her skirt like spiteful fingers, but she ripped away from them and ran. She came into another clearing, a small one. The moon striking between the bows made here a pool of light and touched up something of metal. It was Lenark's revolver. And it bent and seized it. A few feet away rested something else. Something rather like a strangely shaggy cabbage. As Enid touched the gun, she saw what that fringed rondure was. A head, but living, as though its owner had been buried to his bearded chin. What? what? She began to ask aloud. It was surely living, its eyebrows arched and scowled, and its gleaming eyes moved. Its tongue crawled out and licked grinning, hairy lips. She saw it smile, hard and brief, as a knife flashed for a moment from its scabbard. Enid Mandifer almost dropped the revolver. She had become sickeningly aware that the head possessed no body. There is the rest of him, spoke Purcell Mandifer again behind her shoulder, and she saw a heart-shaking terror. Staggering and groping between the trees, a body without a head or hands. She ran again, but slowly and painfully, as though this were in truth a nightmare. The headless hulk seemed to divine her effort at retreat, for it dragged itself clumsily across as though to cut her off. It held out its handless stumps of arms. No use to shoot, came Percival Mandifer's mocking comment. He was following swiftly. That poor creature cannot be killed again. Other shapes were approaching from all sides, shapes dressed in filthy, ragged clothes. The face of one was divided by a cleft, as though Lenark's saber had split it, but no blood showed. Another seemed to have no lower jaw. The remaining top of his face jutted forward like the short visage of a snake lifted to strike. These things had eyes. Turned unblinkingly upon her, they could see and approach. The headless torso blundered at her again, went past by inches. It recovered itself and turned. It knew, somehow, that she was there. It was trying to capture her. She shrunk away, staring around for an avenue escape. Be thankful, Jerome Purcell Mandifer, from somewhere. These are no more than dead men, whipped into a mockery of life. They will prepare you a little for the wonders to come. But Enid had commanded her shuddering muscles. She ran. One of the things caught her sleeve, but the cloth tore and she was free. She heard sounds that could hardly be called voices from the mouths of such as had mouths. And Purcell Mandifer laughed quietly and said something in a language Enid had never heard before. The thick voice of his son LaRue answered him in the same tongue, then called out in English, Enid, you only run in the direction we want you to run. It was true, and there was nothing that she could do about it. The entities behind her were following, not very fast like herdsmen, leisurely driving a sheep in the way it should go. And she knew that the sides of the gully, to north and south, could never be climbed. There was only the slope ahead to the eastward up which Lamanard must have gone. The thought of him strengthened her. If the two of them found the King Horror, the Nameless One, at the base of Fearful Rock, they could face it together. 
She was aware that she had come out of the timber of the ravine. All was moonlight here, painted by the soft pallor and grays and silvers and shadow blacks. There was the rock lifted among the stars, there the stretch of clump dotted plain, and here, almost before her, the narc. He stood poised above a hole in the ground, his saber lifted above his head as though to begin a downward sweep. Something burly was climbing up out of that hole, but even as he tightened his sinews to strike, the narc whirled around and his eyes glared murderously at Annet. Fifteen. Evil's End. Don't! Annet screamed. Don't! It's only I! The narc growled and spun back to face what was now hoisting itself above ground level. And be careful of me too, said the object. It's Jaeger, Mr. Lenark. The point of the saber lowered. The three of them were standing close together on the edge of the open grave. The Lenark looked down. He saw at the bottom the two areas of loose white. Are those the... Yes, Jaeger replied without waiting for him to finish. Two human skins. They are fresh, soft, and damp. And it was listening, but she was past shuddering. One of them, continued Jaeger, was taken from Purcell Mandifer. I know his face. He made a scuffling kick motion with one boot. Clods flew into the grave, falling with a dull plop as upon wet blankets. He kicked more earth down swiftly and savagely. Help me, he said to the others. Salt should be thrown on those skins. That's what the old legends say, but we have no salt. Dirt will have to do. Don't you see? He almost shrieked. Somewhere near here, two bodies are hiding or moving about without these skins to cover them. Both Lanark and Enid knew they had seen those bodies. In a moment, three pairs of feet were thrusting earth down into the grave. Don't! It was a wail from the trees in the ravine, a wail in the voice of Purcell Mandifer. We must return to those skins before dawn. Two black silhouettes wetly shining in the moonlight, had come into the open. Behind them straggled six more, the gorillas. Don't! came the cry again, this time a command. You cannot destroy us now. It is midnight, the hour of the nameless one. At the word midnight, an idea fairly exploded itself in Lenart's brain. He thrust his sword into the hands of his old sergeant. Guard against them, he said in the old tone of command. That book of yours may serve as shield and, and its Bible. I have something else to do. He turned and ran around the edge of the grave and toward the hole that was filled with the ruins of the old house, the hole that emitted a glow of weak blue light. Into it he flung himself, wondering if this diluted gleam of the old unearthly blaze would burn him. It did not. His booted legs felt warmth like that of a hot stove no more. From above he heard the voice of Jaeger shouting tensely and masterfully, a formula from the long-lost friend. Ye evil things stand and look upon me for a moment, while I charm thee drops of blood from you, which you have forfeited. The first from your teeth, the second from your lungs, the third from your heart's own mane. Louder went his voice and higher, as though he had to fight to keep down his hysteria. God bid me vanquish you all. The narc had reached the upward column of the broken chimney. All about his feet lay fragments, glowing blue. He shoved at them with his toe. There was an oblong of metal. He touched it. Yes, that had been a door to an old brick oven. He lifted it. Underneath lay what he had hidden four years ago, a case of an unknown construction. But as he picked it up, he saw that it had a lid. What had Enid overheard from her stepfather so long ago? That he would live and prosper until the secret writing should be taken forth and destroyed. It would never open save at the place of the nameless one. At midnight, under a full moon. With his thumbnail he pried at the lid, and it came open easily. The box seemed full of darkness, and when he thrust in his hands, he felt something crumble like paper burned to ashes. That was what it was, ashes. He turned the case over and let the flakes fall out like strange black snow. From somewhere resounded a shriek, or chorus of shrieks. Then a woman weeping, that would be ended, and a cry of, God be thanked! unmistakably from Jaeger. The blue light died away all around Lenark and his legs were cool. The old basement had fallen strangely dark. Then he was aware of great fatigue, the trembling of his hands, the ropey weakness of his lame leg, and he could not climb out again until Jaeger came and put down a hand. At rosy dawn, the three sat on the front stoop 
of Jaeger's cabin, and it was pouring coffee from a serviceable old black pot. We shall never know all that happened and portended, said Jaeger, taking a mouthful of homemade bread, but what we have seen will tell us all that we should know. This much is plain, out of the narc. Personal man therefore worshipped an evil spirit, that evil spirit had life and power. Perhaps we would know everything if the paper in the box had not burned in the fire, went on Jaeger. That is probably as well. That it burned, I mean. Some secrets are just as well never told. He felt thoughtful, pulled his beard, and went on. Even burned, the power of that document worked. But when the ashes fell from their case, all was over. The bodies of the gorillas were dry bones on the instant, and as for the skinless things that moved and spoke as Mandifer and his son, he broke off, for Annette had turned deathly pale at memory of that part of the business. We shall go back when the sun is well up, said Lenart, and put those things back to rest in their grave. He sat for a moment, coffee cup in hand, and gazed into the brightening sky. To the two items he had spoken of as plainly indicated, he mentally added a third. The worship carried on by Purcell Mandefer was that name French, perhaps, Man de Fer, was tremendously old. He, Purcell, must have received teachings in it from a former votary. His father, perhaps, it must have conducted a complex and secret ritual for decades. The attempted sacrifice rite for which Enid had been destined was something the world would never know not as regards the climax. For a little band of Yankee horsemen, with himself at their head, had blundered into the situation, throwing it completely out of order and spelling for it the beginning of the end. The end had come. Lenark was sure of that. How much of the power and motivity of the worship had been exerted by the nameless one that now must continue nameless? How much of it was personal Mandifer's doing? How much was accident of nature and horror hallucination of witnesses? Nobody could now decide. As Jaeger had suggested, it was probably as well that part of the mystery would remain. Things being as they were, one might pick up the threads of his normal human existence and be happy and fearless. But he could not forget what he had seen. The two Mandifers, able to live or to counterfeit life by creeping from their skins at night, had perished as inexplicably as they had been resurrected. The gorillas, too, whose corpses had challenged him, must be finding a grateful rest now that the awful semblance of life had quitted their slack, butchered limbs, and the blue fire that had burst forth in the midst of the old battle to linger ghostwise for years, the horned image that Jaeger had broken, the seeming powers of the long-lost friend as an amulet and a storehouse of charms. These were items in the strange fabric. He would remember them forever without rationalizing them. He drank coffee, into which someone probably ended had dropped sugar while he mused. Rationalization, he decided, was not enough, had never been enough. To judge a large and dark mystery by what vestigial portions touched one was to err like the blind men in the old doggrel, who, groping at an elephant here and there, called it in turn a snake, a spear, a tree, a fan, a wall. Better not to brood or ponder upon what had happened. Try to be thankful and forget. I shall build my church under Fearful Rock, Jaeger was saying, and it shall be called Fearful Rock no more, but Welcome Rock. Lenart looked up, and it had come and seated herself beside him. He studied her profile. Suddenly he could read her thoughts as plainly as though they were written upon her cheek. She was thinking that grass would grow anew in her front yard and that she would marry King Lenart as soon as he asked her. The End